All right, here we go. We're going to review quiz number one. This is very difficult because I'm by myself. You guys can't respond to me, so. Uh, let's see. We'll do it like this. Hopefully it wasn't too hard for you. Blackboard's been very difficult, so I haven't been able to... Uh, get this stuff working the way I want to. So question one, which of the following is not listed as one of the forces driving change in the economic landscape? This is on page four in the book. The book is here. <clears throat> it's right here. So really this is talking about um, what's been changing in in the business world and, and how it's kind of controlling transportation and how businesses operate. Um, I'll go back to the test here. All right. <clears throat> so, I mean, technology is one of them, obviously, with the Internet especially. Supply chain integration, um, that's what we're talking about in this class, so that's just how everything is integrated, basically using technology, mostly. Consumer empowerment, um, that's also related to technology, and again, mostly to the internet, because uh, consumers have a lot more information now than they used to, especially on pricing, um, you know, alternate places to get things from. Um, so that's really controlling change in the situation. Scarcity of oil is more of a I would say an operations type thing or uh, demand of resources, not really anything like that. So really that's that's the one that's not what we're looking for. Question two, do, why do major retailers now have heavy influence in the supply chain? Um, this kind of goes back to the first one, but uh, this first answer, they're becoming manufacturers, no. They provide their own logistics, maybe that's true, but um, I don't know. That doesn't really apply to the question much. Manufacturers have lost their leverage in the supply chain, that doesn't make too much sense. Um, really the only one that makes sense here is C could have been a different answer on your quiz because they are randomized. And it kind of goes back to the technology thing from the previous question and you know the integration of supply chain management. And really everything comes down to meeting the consumer's needs. And we're also in a very competitive pricing market. So all the way from consumer demand all the way up to the manufacturers where um, you know, the, the middle the middle guy but the large middle guys which are the major retailers they have a lot of influence on what's happening so C is the correct answer here it may not be the letter you had but this answer right here question three <laughs> some people had problems with this this is on page 9. How much has domestic freight ton miles transportation via truck increased between 1990 and 2006? So, let me see. It's page 9. <clears throat> this is going to be like an hour and 15 minute class, just like on campus, huh? <laughs> So going back to the question, these were in percentages. So this is going to be a little math math lesson for people that got confused here. We're talking about truck. Uh, truck transport. So <clears throat> that's this one right here. 
and we're talking about 1990 and 2006, right? So really, we're looking at these here, 848 and 1294. So the question was, <clears throat> how much has it increased? So we have these percentages, percentage choices here. So as an example, it's not one of the choices, but what if our uh, increase was 0%. So we started with 848. If we increased 0%, how much would we have shipped in 2006? That would be the same, 848, because there's no growth. There's no percentage increase. So remember, you have to base everything off of this amount here. This is a baseline amount right here. And since we're dealing with percentages, it's going to be based on this amount. So a 100% increase over 848 would be 848 more uh, miles, ton miles, which would be what, uh, 1700 roughly? Because you'd have to add it to this. So remember 848 is the baseline, so really you have to subtract 848 from, because it's an increase, you have to subtract 848 from this 1294, which is roughly uh, 450, we'll say. And right off the top, you can see 450 is about half of this number right here. So this is increased by about 50%. And we'll go back, and sure enough, that choice is there. And clearly, it wasn't 25 or 100, and it clearly didn't decrease. So 50 is the answer. And just so you have more practice, <laughs> there was another same question, which, yes, people became confused. Some people became confused here. So this is really the same question, but based on rail. Same deal. You go back to rail. This one's actually a little easier because it's close to 1,000, so it's going to be a little easier number to deal with. But again, the baseline is 1,064. So if we had a 0% increase, this number would still be 1,064. If we had a 100% increase, this number would be 2,128. So actually, this one's pretty easy to look at. It's uh, about 800 more. And we're basing this on 1,000, so that's about 80 percent. You can go calculate that if you want with a calculator. But um, there's enough time on these quizzes for you to go do that if you need to. But um, 800 more over a thousand is about 80 percent. Um, and there we go, about 75 percent there. So that's probably what the actual number is. I was just kind of ballparking there. And it wasn't 25 or 125. And it hasn't decreased. So that's how that works. So here, which mode has seen the greatest overall increase? So this is now dealing with absolute numbers, not percentages. So same thing, 1990 to 2006. This is all the modes that were there. So we'll start. Let's see. Actually, they weren't all there. Uh, truck, water, rail, air. Pipeline was not there. So it's these four. Maybe I'll get a tablet so I can actually write on this in the future. We'll see what I can do with that. So th remember, this is absolute numbers now that we're dealing with. So 10, this one was 10.4 to 15.4, so it increased by 5. But remember, this is in billions, so there's actually 5 billion here. Truck increased by, we already talked about this, about 450, roughly. Rail increased by about just under 800, so that's more than 450. And water actually decreased, 833 to 561, so that was a decrease, a decrease there. So we're looking for the largest, what was the actual question, greatest overall increase, so that would be rail, increased by almost 800. So 
we'll pick that. Hopefully, I don't get one of these wrong. Everyone will laugh at me, right? <laughs> okay, back to econ. Everyone loves econ, right? <clears throat> so, almost everyone got this right because it was in the book. <laughs> This was page 11. Yes. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go beyond just telling you what the right answer is. Um, this could come up easily. I don't know in another class, in graduate school. In graduate school, it's gonna come up for sure, especially if you try and get an MBA. I guarantee this will come up a lot. They're gonna expect you to know it like off the top of your. And in the future, it could come up, and I'll give you an easy way to remember it, just so you won't forget. Hopefully, you won't forget. Um, and you can just kind of keep that with you. So, elasticity of demand is just based on how much people are willing to pay for something, and then the demand that kind of comes from that. But it, it's hard to compare something if it's a one-dollar item versus a million-dollar. There, it's, you can't even compare it. So remember that this is going to be calculated off of percentages. That way, it doesn't matter. So if you're if you have a dollar and you're paying fifty percent less, it's fifty cents, right? So that's fifty cents. A million dollars, half of it's going to be five hundred thousand dollars, but it's still the same fifty percent. So remember. Elasticity of demand is going to be based off of percentage. And not only in price, but also in quantity. That way, when you're dealing with 5 units or 5 million units or 50 units, it doesn't matter because it's just a percentage. So, and it's obviously it's something divided by something else. So, here the first choice and the last choice are going to be wrong. And this is where people get mixed up. Is it price over quantity or quantity over price? And this is going to be a little bit of cheating, but just so you can remember it. And then, you know, sometimes you need little references to remember things rather than just remembering the raw formula. So P and Q are in alphabetical order, right? In the alphabet. That's not, that is not the formula. It's Q over P. So Q, P. It's not in alphabetical order. Maybe you can remember that. So it's going to be percentage, top and bottom, right? Because we're only dealing with percentage changes. And then we're going to deal with quantity over price. And when something is elastic, this ratio is going to be, the, the, the number that comes out of it is going to be greater than 1. If it's not el inelastic, it's going to be less than 1. So, maybe you could kind of remember that if it's elastic, it's better, so it's more than 1, I don't know. But basically, greater than 1 is elastic, less than 1 is inelastic. One is like a unity situation where there's no there's no change. One percent, if the price drops one percent, you buy one percent less. It's it's just direct. It's a direct uh, relationship there. So hopefully that's helpful. And that follows up with these next two questions, which people had problems with. Okay, so I'm going to give you another thing to help you remember this because I, I myself remember I could not get elastic or inelastic straight. So again, this is going to be not really with the raw definition of it, but just a, a easy way to remember. And then if you keep that in mind, eventually you'll you'll get it straight through through the definition of it. But basically. What you want to use to determine 
But remember, if something's elastic or inelastic, if you use gasoline. Just use gasoline. Because we can all relate to it. Gasoline is something, I don't know, unless we don't drive, for the most part, we need it. We have to have it. If it gets really expensive, we're still going to pay to have it. Um, also, it's not elastic because it doesn't bounce. <laughs> That's just an easy way to remember. So, gasoline is, therefore, inelastic. And use that to start deciding whether these items are elastic or inelastic. So, remember, gasoline it doesn't bounce because it's not a rubber ball. It's inelastic. And remember, no matter what, we're going to pay for it because we have to have it. So, we'll kind of start on this question here. So, what is inelastic? This is similar to gasoline. Delivered pizza, kind of a luxury. Movie tickets, definitely expendable in income luxury. LCD TV, luxury. Ambulance service. If you have to go to the hospital, pretty much that you're gonna, you have no choice, right? So this is inelastic. And on the flip side, elastic is something that is, if it's expensive, you probably won't buy it, and if it's cheap, you'll buy more because you don't really have to have it. So here we go, gasoline, our friend. No. Fire department service, that's like gasoline. Electricity is like gasoline. Starbucks coffee, mm, I don't know. For Starbucks addicts, maybe. <laughs> maybe there's no answer there, but in general theory, Starbucks coffee is a uh, kind of optional thing that we would only buy if we have extra money and if we can afford it. So that's the answer here. <clears throat> Question nine, landed cost. This is on page somewhere, page 13. <clears throat> it's 13. And, get here. and this is kind of a logical definition. Landed cost is just the cost of the item plus the transport. So landed cost is say for this item cost three dollars to produce dollar to get there landed cost is four dollars so pretty straightforward definition on that one uh, that one's pretty easy question 10 which of the following is not listed as one of the service components for freight transportation demand this is kind of also straightforward just from the text Page 14, I believe. And yeah. I mean, just look here and kind of read it. Uh, there's a table. I believe there's a table or something. Where is it? There it is. So those were all kind of describing everything up there, but this is uh, kind of tells you the answer here. basically just the components of, of freight demand and what a, uh, <clears throat> a customer would need or expect out of transit, transportation. So insurance rate is really kind of not really a, a feature. It's just, uh, I don't know, it just doesn't belong here. So that's the answer here, it's, which is not. 11, in a typical logistics network, production plants usually ship directly to customers to save transportation costs. Production plants, so this is where things are being made directly to customers. This probably wouldn't work well because they're not really set up to handle individual orders. Uh, they're more, more uh, set up for large quantity wholesale distribution, um, you know, splitting things up is more of the middleman's job. Uh, this was on page 19. There's a picture. Okay. Okay, this one was good. So, 
as it said, uh, in a typical logistics network, we have uh, raw material, which goes to plants. Plants produce items. Those go to distribution centers, which are more, equip more equipped for distribution to end customers. And remember, these customers could actually be the ones that sell to end users. Um, every supply chain is different, but um, and these are usually like if if that was the case, these are like larger wholesalers or distribution centers. But um, you generally won't see plants go directly to the customer because it's it's just very tedious and it's not worth their time. Um, they work on large volumes and they just want to get the stuff out and not really have to deal with it. Sometimes it's even items that need uh, final assembly or final packaging that would be done at the distribution centers. So um, <clears throat> this would be false based on that. And there was one more picture here. Same thing, raw material, manufacturing, and they, uh, warehouses store the goods until they go to market. And, that, and that's the other issue, why it wouldn't really go from the plant to the, to the consumer is um, storage. You know, the inventory has to be held somewhere. So that's that. The bullwhip effect. So a number of you are not supply chain majors, so you probably aren't familiar with this, or we're not familiar with this, or may not have heard of it. But this is actually a very, uh, very important concept. Um, this guy Hao Li, who's supposed to be, I guess, the father of supply chain management, um, up at Stanford, coined the term uh, a while back. But this is based on. I guess really a, a kind of a, um, I don't know if it's paranoia, but oh, I'm being worried about having enough inventory on hand to fulfill a, a demand. And basically, we can only estimate our demand off of uh, past performance to really you know, accurately do it. And even that's not correct. So normally we'll add on what's called a safety stock which is depending on the company and the industry it's different but say it's 20 percent so we have our projected demand and then we'll add another 20 percent to that and keep that much on hand just in case we sell a little bit more that way we don't run out and have a stock out situation which is um, theoretically bad and again every industry is different every company is different but you really don't want that situation so you kind of overstock yourself. And that, that problem goes further back up the supply chain to your supplier where they have the same issue. And they're not sure about demand. They have to estimate it. They keep a safety stock on hand. And what happens is this, this just gets amplified <laughs> further, further and further up the chain. And, and it just... It's like it's literally like a bullwhip where it just becomes a bigger whip back and forth. And I guess, I don't know, say 20 years ago, it was a lot more difficult to deal with this. But um, nowadays, with good ERP systems, enterprise resource uh, planning systems, there's another concept which, again, some of you may not be familiar with. It's called uh, VMI, Vendor Managed Inventory. And what that is, is you really have to have a vendor that you can trust, but you allow them to have access to your uh, inventory levels and sales levels. So they can actually see how much you've been selling and see your sales pattern. So they can adjust their uh, production and supply to you based on that. So really there's no, there's no um, kind of center area that's getting kind of used with overstock or estimating it, it kind of just becomes one entity because they can see what's happening so that that's 
what you would do to kind of reduce this. Um, of course, you can't ever completely do that, but uh, that alleviates it a lot. So the bullwhip, bullwhip effect has little effect on how much inventory a company will try to keep on hand. That is, uh, that should be false because it has a huge effect. And I'm going to flip forward to another question. And that was on page something, page 22, if you want to kind of read about it a little bit more. It's, they didn't go very much in depth with that. So 16. So this goes back to what we just talked about. Um, <clears throat> one highly effective and efficient way. So efficiency is, of course, keeping costs down. Increase inventory levels by 25%. No, that's not good because now you have holding costs, you need a bigger warehouse. Um, that's not going to work. Use multiple suppliers. That's that's really not even addressing the issue, really. Utilize more frequent deliveries. Maybe very minimally, though. Not, not enough to really fix that problem because it's still going to keep going further up and down the chain. Um, but like we just said, if you use a vendor managed inventory system, that's that's a very good way to deal with that. So that's the answer to that one. 16. That will go back. Maybe I should have put that here, huh? I don't know. Uh, 13. <coughs> Reliability in transportation is defined as and this is on page 14. This is that where it was? No. Yes. Maybe. Let me see. I think it was 14. Maybe not. I think I wrote down the wrong page. No, I'm totally lost. Uh, no. Where was that? It was on 14, yes. So this was, confuse myself, this is nothing new. It was inside the service components, so reliability, and the definition is here, so I mean, you can just look it up, but this is where it is. Consistency of transit times. So, answer is D. straightforward definition. 14. Historically, what mode of transportation has been the most influential on the location of major cities? Uh, this was on 16. I don't think it was clearly mentioned in the book. This book is not... I don't think it's the greatest book. I'm not overly pleased with it, but it's all we really had. Um... Page 16. So it's kind of it's kind of mentioned here. Um, water transportation played an important role in the location of many major cities around the world. Early settlers in the U.S. relied on water transportation via the ocean to link European markets. This is kind of logical, right? Everyone came and they hit the East Coast first. Um, so. Like New York, uh, Philadelphia, they were really port cities when, when they were established. And this was you know, well into the 1800s before the railroads were uh, prominent. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, the railroads didn't really come into play until like uh, 1880s, late 1800s. Um, so before that, um, water was really the main source of transportation. There was no highways, really. Um, the railroad wasn't there, like I said, and so water was the only way. So ocean, 
Um, you know, they would go port to port along the, the eastern seaboard and then also within the rivers. So, you know, uh, the Mississippi River, um, and then the Great Lakes, you know, moving around that area. So really water, water kind of dictated where major cities would be located. And this question wasn't so clear. Uh, historically, you can't really say when history. Um, don't worry too much about these, these quizzes. Um, you know, what, one or two questions here and there missed isn't really going to affect your grades. So. But this question was really looking for this answer of water based on this chapter page 16 what was there so 15 when did senior level management begin to reorganize the profit potentials associated with proper supply chain management I hope you can hear me because now I've recorded I don't know how long here <laughs> not uh, yeah that won't be good this is on page 17 uh, again this is just in the text reading and it kind of it kind of mentions here just how it came into play and really in the in the 80s is when it, people started becoming aware of it really and that goes back to uh, Toyota who was really um, one of the forerunners of, of efficient supply chain management and in the 80s is kind of when they snuck up on GM and really pounced on them and I mean, zoom past them really, and uh, that's when when the domestics really took domestic auto manufacturers took note of Japanese cars becoming much higher in quality, and I mean they really were caught off guard, and it was too late, and uh, it was just way too late because Toyota had been already doing that for in the 80s. They were probably already doing it for 20 years, so it wasn't something that happened overnight, but yeah, so that's when the supply chain, the supply chain concept really started coming into play, as the book says here. And in the 90s is when other organizations really started to be aware of it and, and realized that it was very important in, in almost every way because, you know, literally proper supply chain management starts at raw material and goes down to customer satisfaction. So gamut of, of a product or a service. So 90s is the correct answer here. 16 we did. 17. This one was a little confusing. Um, I guess really I didn't like this question too much. But, um, this was on page 10. Maybe people got lazy and didn't want to look back and find the answer. So it's here. Um, and this whole blurb kind of talks about how we need to just keep, it's better to keep track of goods and where they are in the supply chain and during transportation where they are. Um, and RFID has, like GPS is really global positioning system, satellite, whatever, same thing, right? That's kind of uh, the satellites that are up there that you use to you know, triangulate a position of where you are, but um, it's not, it, it's not, I don't know how to describe it. You kind of use it to know where you are, but You really can't have a GPS system on every pallet and every uh, every piece of you know inventory that you have. So I know this question is a little confusing, but RFID really is is what they're after because that um, 
that's how they're able to keep track of trailers in trailer yards, um, pallets, Walmart. Walmart's very heavy on RFID in their warehouse. Everything's pretty automated. Uh, they need to keep track of what's where, you know, at what time. So um, that's kind of all written here. You can kind of read it again if you want, page 10. Um, but for that question, RFID is really what the question was looking for. And on to the fun stuff, which wasn't really in the book. Uh, the second one was, but I just want to see how resourceful you were. <laughs> see if people would look for this or not. And this is actually very, very, very important, and especially for us because it's close by. Uh, the freight rail corridor that services uh, the port of Long Beach and LA and goes to the large distribution hub, um, I guess it's near Vernon, kind of south of downtown. That's really where all the goods get distributed to the rest of the country that came in through the ports. And also remember that these two ports here uh, combined are the sixth largest in the world. So very large volumes coming through here. And I forgot offhand, but I believe it's about 60% of the goods that come into the country come through those two ports. So the country as a whole depends on these uh, to a large extent, and there's a lot of traffic coming through there. So in the 90s, the port and the city of LA and all, all the entities got together and um, created this mostly below ground, or they call it below grade, uh, this below grade rail system to connect the port to this uh, distribution hub. And that was really to, I, I don't know if any of you had seen it before, but those tracks ran above ground down Alameda Boulevard. A um, bunch of rail crossings, very dangerous very noisy, um, you know, not efficient for the trains or, or the, the traffic or the neighborhood. So they put everything below grade, uh, below ground as a, as a way to, you know, clear up the neighborhoods, keep that, that railway running very efficiently so it didn't have any, have to stop at all. And, um, you know, also it was a very big safety issue that the cars didn't have to cross anymore. And the other problem is these this this railway plus many major highways, which we'll also talk about later, go through predominantly poor neighborhoods, and it's because they can't fight back. And stuff comes through, you know, bills come through, or or, or things come through, you know, the, the legislation, cities, they can't they can't fight it because they don't have the backing and. You don't see any highways going through Beverly Hills um, because it won't. It'll never happen. It will never happen. They won't allow it. The residents would just you know, fight back, and they have lawyers, and they have all the money in the world to fight, and it won't happen. But the poor neighborhoods can never fight back, so they end up just getting all this stuff just running right through their backyard. And part of what we talked about in one of the discussion threads is is you know the problems from this there's a lot of health issues that come from all this traffic especially diesel because trucks run on diesel and trains run on diesel and it, it's just really bad for the air bad for health so um, yeah we'll talk about that later but so this was called the Alameda corridor that's the answer for 18 very important because it's where we are at you know it, it, it affects us and all the companies in the area and all of us are trying to look for jobs and whatnot so you know that has something to do with it and especially the ports too those are also uh, major uh, things we would deal with in, in our field so and also the people that aren't uh, supply chain majors same thing I mean, even it, it's good to be aware that you know the, the significance of this this um, corridor right here this transit corridor what it does and how it impacts pretty much all companies. 
And the last one, 19, our interstate highway system was initiated in what year, by whom, and for what purpose? It was inspired by what other famous transportation infrastructure? So, actually, I added this question and didn't realize it was in the book, too, but I just figured to see if you guys would kind of go out and, and see what this was about, and it was extra credit, as was the previous question. So if you didn't want to do it, that was fine. But um, Dwight Eisenhower, as president, uh, initiated this through the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956. And it was in the making for a good, uh, I believe, 10 years, maybe maybe longer. And there was just a lot of controversy about what its purpose was, how it would be funded, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And... Um, he was a very, very strong supporter of it, and this goes back to the second part of the question here, um, because he was a, a uh, commander in the army during World War II, and when he went to Germany, he saw the Autobahn there, and I guess to him it was one of the most amazing things he had ever seen, and you know it's very nice high-speed highway systems um, it serviced the whole country and especially in in a situation of war this could be very important and that kind of goes back to this other part of the question for what purpose so he, he kind of pushed this through under the guise of that this was really for the purposes of national defense and as a study before this he, I guess he got on a convoy and crossed the country. Maybe this was what, I don't remember the, the history of it. This could have been when he was still a soldier before he was president. But at some point, he had, he had gotten in a convoy and driven across the country. And, and I think it took them, God, it was, it was pretty long. Two weeks, I think, or something like that. And it was just not acceptable situation if there was some kind of invasion or a need for defense on any of the any of the you know, extreme areas of the country uh, they couldn't mobilize the military enough to defend effectively so he, he really thought it was necessary and um, of course there were economic benefits to go with that because it would it would link everything and um, of course that's what's helped to shrink the country as a whole to allow a lot of what was previously the port or railroad restricted cities to link up and connect with the rest of the country and that really allowed for specialization of certain areas like Pittsburgh you know, a lot of steel mills there you know they could really export and get their product out um, you know a lot of agriculture out here in California that could be shipped to the rest of the country easily um, and, and trains were pretty effective at it, but at the same time, they, they can only ride on the track. So they couldn't really make the last legs of the, last legs of, of the deliveries or service you know, cities. And one last thing on this. So, as you know, this is the interstate highway system. So, does anyone see a, a pattern with the numbering? No, no one raised their hand. So, I guess I'll have to I'll have to answer. Generally, the way it's set up is north-south routes are odd numbered, and they start from west and they go east. So we have five. We all know five. Fifteen. That's our favorite, right? Because it connects to Vegas. Uh, Twenty-five here. 35 uh, starts in Texas, I believe, near Dallas somewhere. Yeah, 35 goes up to Chicago or towards Chicago. So forth, going all the way across to 95, which services the eastern seaboard. Maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't. Pretty interesting, huh? I didn't, I didn't know myself, and then one day I saw that, and it was just so amazing that I didn't see this pattern. So the even numbers... Same deal, 
except those go, uh, they, they travel uh, east and west. They start from the south and go north. So the lowest one, I believe, is eight. Uh, that's in San Diego. I don't think there's a number lower than that. The largest, the, the most southern major one is 10, which we all know starts in Santa Monica, goes all the way across and ends in Florida. Here. Goes through El Paso, Texas, uh, through the Gulf, and then to Florida. There's 20, which starts somewhere in Texas. I've actually driven here. Oh, yeah, it starts a little past El Paso. Kind of goes up here and goes towards Atlanta. Uh, 30 is also from Dallas. I believe. Yeah, 30 is here. Uh, 40 starts in Barstow. Again, our, one of our favorite places. It's on the way to Vegas. Goes across. This is a good uh, route if you're going east instead of 10. Um, and then you can cut back down again. It's kind of the same thing. So that's how that works. Now, there's also three-digit ones. And remember, interstates are the ones with these little red and blue uh, logos. So they're kind of federally funded, I guess you could think of it that way. The three-digit routes, which some are on here. I don't know why they have them. And then some places they don't. So we have them. We all know them. 405, 605, 710, 210. Um, those are routes that generally go around or service outlying areas from downtown areas. So if you think about it, that makes sense. Like the 405 is a spur route of 5. Because remember, it splits off from 5 up by New Hall, and then it joins back again down by Irvine, Lake Forest. So it really goes from the same place to the same place, but it kind of goes around downtown, because 5 goes straight through downtown, right? So 405 goes around it. Uh, 710 is kind of an alternate route around downtown, not in such a uh, definitive way like 405, but same idea, 710, 605, 210. Um, so that's the logic behind those. And those numbers get reused because I know in, even in Seattle there's a 405. So. Um, and then uh, up north, Northern California, there's, what, 280, 480, 580, 680. They have a lot of 80s. Um, and I think those, because they have to do with 80, the one that they're dealing with. Like our 710, I, I don't know if that's true. I think it is, though. I think it's, it's, I don't know that definition, but maybe you could look it up if you're bored. I think it has to do with the interstate that it routes off of. That's the ending numbers. So 405, right? Well, 5, 710 is off 10. 605, I guess 605 goes off of 5, 210 goes off of 10, kind of, not really, it's parallel to it. So none of these rules ever, <coughs> ever stay, right? Like area codes used to be 1 or 0 as the middle number, but not anymore. So that's that, um, so that's the first week. Hopefully this was all audible and usable. Um, I'll check it after I'm done. I'll probably post it up no matter what, because... I don't know how long I've been recording here, but it's been a long time. Um, I'll work on the second week, and then by the third week, we should bet we should be on a regular way to deal with this stuff like this. Um, like I said, if I don't have my office still, I don't know what's going on with that, which is ridiculous. But it'll be Wednesdays, uh, five to seven. I actually have a place that I think I can in one of the conference rooms that I'm actually going to have meetings before that anyway, so I think I may be able to just stay in there for a couple hours. If that's the case, I'll let you know right away. Um, also, that Doodle survey, I was just kind of checking to see when people were free. It looks like Tuesday and Thursday is the, the most convenient for everyone as a whole. Um, maybe before the midterm, and then maybe one other time we can have kind of a review session or workshop for the project, which I haven't implemented yet either. Um, but I'll let you know on that also. But uh, maybe a couple days we could you know, meet as a class. And possibly for the project, we may, if you want to, do it as a presentation. 
and we'll set a date for that, but um, I'll figure that out. So for the rest of the class, um, we'll do some stuff in the book, but I've actually put together more material that's more relevant to what we need to deal with in this area of the country, and then also that is more useful for people that are not the supply chain majors. Um, unfortunately, they told me I was for sure going to be teaching this class like the week before it started. That kind of made it difficult to, to plan out. But um, the book is, is decent for covering this early stuff. So that's it, and I'll work on week two. Good luck.